And from that text again, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, I do not give to you as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Sometimes I am afraid of things I should fear. Sometimes I am afraid of things I should not fear. And sometimes I do not fear the things I should actually be afraid of. So last week, I think God wanted to introduce me to the types of storms and weather that rarely happen in New England, but are very common on the plains and in the Midwest. To explain, Thursday night, I went to see the Minnesota Twins play the Houston Astros in downtown Minneapolis with an old friend, Eric. But the two of us could not finish the game because severe thunderstorms blew through with 70-mile-an-hour winds, and we had to shelter inside Target Field. And then when I got home to my friend T. Michael's house, a suburb of Minneapolis where I was staying the night, the power was out and a 50-foot pine tree in their backyard was down for the count. And then the next morning, I drove 70 miles north to St. John's University, where I had my writing retreat last week. And about 11.30 that morning, well, this happened for almost 25 minutes. But it wasn't over yet. That night, I was driving home to my on-campus apartment about 7 p.m. when I looked up into the sky and I saw that cloud looming above and all around me. It's called a shelf cloud. It's the kind of cloud that develops when two weather systems bang into each other, very cold and very hot. Shelf clouds are what birth tornadoes. And so, um, that night, I was driving on the road, and I thought about the idea, as a, only a stupid New Englander could, maybe I could outrun the storm, even though it was moving at 85 miles an hour. But then my on-campus host, Carla, called me, and she said the tornado sirens were going off on campus, and I needed to find shelter, and very, very fast. She said even if I had to pull my car over to the side of the road. I spotted the movie theater that I go to when I'm there, and I parked in the lot, and I pushed through the front door that was being held open by the manager. And I and a school bus full of high school kids who were also seeking shelter went with the cinema manager into the theater in the very center of the building. And then we sat and we waited for 40 minutes. I'm still here. So. But I have to tell you, I have not been that afraid and that fearful and that scared in a very long time, at least not of a natural phenomenon. And of course, I was right to be afraid. If I had tried to race past the storm, I probably would have lost, maybe even badly, and a tornado did touch down about a mile from where I was. My fear, in a way, it saved me. It reminded me of the smart thing to do. My fear focused me like a laser beam in survival. My fear shut out all other thoughts and got me to shelter from the storm. The human fear response. This is how it is supposed to work. It is instinctual to want to live, to save oneself, or to save loved ones from harm. You are walking in a neighborhood and you get some spooky vibes and you know you just need to get going and out of there. That's good fear. You feel a lump in your body or have an odd pain that won't go away and it concerns, yes, maybe even scares you and you decide to get it checked out and maybe that vigilance, maybe it will save you. You are with your kids and one of them lets go of your hand and they begin to run towards traffic and you yell, stop, at the top of your lungs and your child stops afraid, probably cries, and you grab their hand, 
because you're afraid too of them getting hurt. These are the times we are afraid of things we are supposed to be afraid of, events, situations, times when fear is the difference between harm and safety, maybe even life and death. But then I think of times when we humans should have been afraid, even very afraid of something, but we are not. Like a friend of mine who smoked cigarettes for a long time and then finally quit. But the weird thing is, while he had this hard-to-kick monkey on his back, this addiction, when he knew the chances of getting cancer from that habit, it never really scared him. Not until he actually had a medical scare a spot on his lung discovered on an MRI. Then he was afraid, and then he quit. But before then, he was in a state of denial, where we block out something from our consciousness because it's just too hard to face. And as I said, sometimes I am afraid of things I really should not be afraid of, like the future, at least parts of tomorrow, of the days and years ahead that I have little or no control over, Why fear something? Why put all of this energy, my limited spiritual energy, into worrying over something I cannot predict and I cannot control and I cannot change or influence much of the time, yet how much time I spend angsting over what is to come? But none of you are like that, right? So to recap, sometimes we are rightfully afraid of things we should fear, like a storm, Sometimes we are not afraid of things we should actually fear, like some threat to our health. And sometimes we fear things we should actually not fear, like the future. Fear, fear, fear. The biblical text we heard today is very familiar, probably to many of us. I use it at every funeral service that I do. Um, It contains reassuring promises by Jesus to the disciples about what he will do to help them with their fears, especially their fears about him going away, because he speaks these words at the Last Supper. He makes two promises to them to give them courage. One is that the Holy Spirit, that he calls the Advocate, after Jesus leaves, this reflection of God, this part of the Trinity, will stay on earth, right here with them and with us and give us wisdom and strength and, yes, courage to those disciples as they sought to spread Jesus' message of love. And second, Jesus promises them peace, peace that is so calming and so reassuring and so powerful that in that reassuring promise, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, my peace I leave with you. Now, the Greek word for fear that Jesus speaks of is a familiar one as well. It is phobos. Phobos, as in phobia. So, friends, what do you fear this day? What are the things that keep you up at night or wake you up in the morning? What storms loom large in your heart? What are you afraid of? One philosopher I read in preparation for today's sermon says that there are really just four fears that all human beings share. Fear of failure, not being able to do that which we hope we can do or think we must do. Fear of the future, not being able to control that which is to come. Fear of loneliness or being unloved or being alone, being bereft. And fear of death, which speaks for itself. Friends, I'd say the problem is not that we have fears, no. To be human, to be a child of God, to live in a world in which humans have free will and therefore just about anything is possible, to be capable of having great love for others and therefore also having the possibility of having that love rejected or of losing that love, to inhabit bodies that are mortal and have expiration dates, it is pretty normal and natural to be afraid at times. I don't think what Jesus is saying is, do not ever be afraid. That is impossible, and if anyone ever tells you that they are afraid of nothing, that they fear nothing in this life, I'd say they are either foolhardy or self-deluding. Friends, to be human is just to be afraid sometimes. 
I think what Jesus is trying to teach us when he says, do not be afraid, and God's peace I leave with you, he's trying to say that when we are afraid, we can do two things. We can seek to change the things we can in terms of those fears, and we can ask God for help with all of the other fears. And we can give over to God our fears, especially let God carry the fears and that weight let God have ultimate control over the future, over, in fact, most questions, and ask God to help us to do just what we can. Where we are with what we have is very human, humans. So some things that we fear, we can do things to change that fear, to change conditions. If we fear for our health, we can lose weight, or we can eat healthy, or we can exercise, or we can stop smoking, or we can drink less, or we can walk every day. If we fear global warming, we can buy an electric car, we can equip our homes or equip our churches we're about to do with solar, we can drive less, we can take public transportation, we can elect people who take climate change seriously and want to do something about it. If we fear not being loved or losing love, we can ask God for the courage to love others in spite of the truth that we can lose that love. If we fear losing a loved one, we can ask God to give us the commitment to love that person as much as possible every single day that we have with them and then give over the rest to God. You know, we can do much in the face of our fears and ask God for help. And we can also face into some fears and just confess to our essential powerlessness in the face of these fears and then try our best to hand them over to God. Do you hear that? To give them to God, to God's sovereignty, God's wisdom, and God's outcomes. One of my favorite observations about human fear and faith, and you've heard me say it before, is by Corrie Ten Boom. She was a Dutch woman who during World War II saved hundreds of Jews from the Nazis. And she said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Isn't that a great quote? Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Now, I'm not saying it is easy to give tomorrow over to God, and yet, what is the alternative? Fear, anxiety, worry, sleeplessness. I was visiting, I was visiting with my mom yesterday, and we both agreed it is a Hudson family trait to worry, and to worry a lot, and to worry too much, and I'd add, to worry over things that we have little or no control over. I pointed out to her that when it comes to worrying, I actually like to suffer in advance for some negative outcome that may or may not come true. I save time that way, right? Pre-suffering, you might call it, like suffering and fear over whether or not the woman I have a date with next week will like me or not. To save time, I'm going to suffer about that right now. (laughs) What about the future of our church as we try and figure out like every other single house of worship in America, how to do God's work in 2022 with this generation of people. I have no idea, but I think I'll be negative and miserable in the next few years, even though I've not got any idea about what the future will bring or about what God is doing. Do you hear that? Do you see the futility of such fears, such brooding, such angst, such unhappiness, all that energy, that spiritual energy put into worrying and being afraid of that which is yet to come, which is uncontrollable, which is not in our hands. I can hold on to those fears for dear life, or I can let them go. I can let them go and give them to God. Because finally, when it comes to those fears, I believe God only knows. God only knows. Do not be afraid. Know God's peace and know the advocate, the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus' hope and prayer for all of us, for every human, to be afraid of what we should be afraid of and then work with God to have the power to change those things and to not be afraid of that we cannot control and to give it over to God. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, God, for the living of these days, for all of the things we are 
afraid of. God, grant us peace. God, help us to trust in you always and in all ways. Let all God's people of courage declare. Amen.